You know, it really is uncanny at the moment how similar the figures are in terms of new cases per million in the United Kingdom and the United States. But the big difference is the United Kingdom's numbers are coming down because of a strict lockdown. In the United States, the numbers are coming down because of the restrictions that are being taken, but not as strict as the UK. And we're going to see the implications of this. But this is only pure coincidence that these numbers are the same, but it is incredible Quite an incredible coincidence. Canada numbers are starting to slowly go down, but we'll look at a risk to that as well. Um, now, this is the United States here with numbers coming down. This is Canada with numbers gradually coming down. This is Portugal, as has happened with the new uh, variant has arrived in Portugal, causing these problems. So um, this is what we're going to unpick a bit today. Welcome, of course, to this video. It is, it is Monday, the 25th of January. Now, I think some of the good news so far is that the, uh, the United States has got an increasing awareness of how vulnerable it is at the moment. Now, I'm going to start giving you some information on this, and we'll also look at some uh, how this applies to other countries as well. So um, getting on to the detail on this, this is from the United States Centers for Disease Control. The, this is direct quote. The CDC has reached out to UK officials and is reviewing their new mortality data associated with variant B. 117, the more transmissible and we think more dangerous variant. Now you can tell this is written by an American author because it says reached out. In the UK would always say uh, contacted. But very encouraging to see that there is a, it appears to be high level um, toing and froing and exchanges of information between the, the CDC and, and various UK authorities. So that's, that's good to see. Um, and we'll find out later that they do have access to data that's not in the public domain, which helps decision making. Now, in terms of the new variant in the United States at the moment, um, this this article here, this this one's for, where was that one from? That's that's a CNN one, um, but it's it's reported in several uh, outlets. Only 195 cases so far. Well, I wouldn't put the only in. I think there's 195 cases so far but now affecting 22 states. Now, I checked on this a few days ago, it was 10 states. Bear in mind that in the UK, we've sequenced about 160,000 uh, genomes. In Denmark, uh, which you mentioned day before yesterday, they're sequencing 100% of positive tests. In the United States, they've just got the testing up to 0.3% of positive cases. So to say that the United States is flying blind in terms of uh, the new variant would not be overstatement. Uh, they've realised this, they're getting their act together now, but it's going to take a bit longer yet, I'm afraid, to escalate the amount of tests being done. So 195 cases, but 22 states. Many more cases are going undetected, almost, almost certainly. Uh, California and Florida seem to be returning higher numbers at the moment, but because the testing is so poor, the significance of that is currently not not very clear. Now, um, this chap here, um, he's an epidemiologist, is is on the coronavirus transition team with the new administration. Michael Osterholm. Now, is is a well known uh, epidemiologist in the states, director for the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Minnesota. So um, it sounds like a good pick for, for, the, for the transition team. Now, he has said this, that from um, public and non-public data, he's convinced that the new variant is deadlier. So he's convinced by the data. So, of course, we know that the new variant is perhaps 55% more transmissible. Uh, but uh, Michael Osterholm is accepting the data that the new variant is also more likely to cause more severe disease and indeed more likely to cause death, another reason to be concerned. Um, so he says the data is mounting and some of it I can't share. Uh, that clearly supports, the, supports that B117 is causing more severe illness and increased death. So in other words, he's got some data that's in the public domain, uh, some data that's not in the public domain that is not free to share. Fair enough, it, it, will, it will come out. But um, causing more severe illness and increased death. So um, the possibility of this variant spreading in the United States and indeed other countries like, like we've just seen with Portugal 
and the risk for Denmark is significant, as in other European countries. Um, we already know this variant has increased transmission, and so this is more very bad news. It's kind of a double whammy. So um, that is a concern, the new variant spreading in the United States. But also, there's other new variants around the world, like Brazil and South Africa. Now, let's look at the South African new variant now, which is, to be quite honest, um, this is a significant threat to global health from what we know about it. It's, it really is um, significant. Um, South African variant 501Y, so it's the 501st amino acid, and it's the Y form uh, of the amino acid, but this is on the spike protein, this spike protein, which is the infectious part that actually binds into the ACE receptor site on the surface of cells to allow the virus RNA from the body of the virus itself into the cell. So this is the critical part and it's on the receptor binding domain, the part that actually binds into the ACE2 receptor site from the spike protein on the virus. V2 variant 2. Uh, now, the data so far um, is difficult to assess, but Reuters have assessed this. And th th they come out with a figure of 50% more infectious. So the South Africa variant and the B117 UK variant, both equally more transmissible. But of course, you don't want both of them. And this is the risk. So um, it's in at least 20 countries, not yet found in the US, but quite what that means is, is harder to say. Few cases have been isolated in the UK, but they are quarantining. So as far as we know, it's not spreading in the UK. So basically this gives us in many Western countries this uh, window of opportunity to keep it out. We just need to keep this thing out. Now, um, President Biden imposes a ban on most non-US citizens entering the country who have recently been in South Africa. So um, the problem here is, is here that US citizens can return. So the US citizens returning from South Africa who, or who have visited South Africa, who retain the right to come back into the United States, absolutely vital that they completely self-isolate for, I would say, 14 days. I think the current guidelines are less than that, but 10 to 14 days will be safe. Now, last week, uh, entry ban uh, was reimposed for Brazil, the United Kingdom, Ireland, 26 countries in Europe that allow travel across open borders. Now, to be fair, the Trump administration, the previous administration, had banned flights from Brazil as early as, I um, can't, can't remember when it was, but they had, they had banned them already. And then it was lifted, but now it's been reimposed. So now we have clarity. So um, the United States are going to ban South Africa travel, but it's not for a few days yet that this kicks in. I think this kicks in on Saturday. Um, so that's still a concern from South Africa. But Brazil, um, United Kingdom, of course, Ireland, where the UK variant has been rampant, and 26 countries in Europe that allow travel across open borders. So there's still, still 26 countries in Europe that the United States is concerned about, and rightly so. But we're also um, concerned about these 26 countries in Europe, that the new variants can spread quite easily between these countries as they follow their policy of um, keeping borders as open as possible. So this means that, that new, the new variants are going to spread in Europe as well. And the vaccination programmes are progressing in the UK and the US, but in Canada they're very slow and in Europe they're very slow. Um, there is plenty of time, unfortunately, for this to be a really major issue. This is why I'm really going on about it a bit. Now, I want to give you some sort of firm, firmish data on this. Now, th this is a paper just published. A high transmission uh, variant in Canada. So this is an example from Canada. But this information will apply absolutely anywhere. Absolutely anywhere um, where there's potentially the new variant. And that is, that is everywhere, unfortunately. So it will apply uh, everywhere. So th this data is looking at Canada particularly, though. Um, and the question is, what happens if a high transmission variant becomes established community transmission uh, and is transmitted in the general community in Canada? What would this mean? Now, I'm going to give you the bottom line on this. 
um, and that, that's in the shape of this graphic here. Now, um, this graph here, this is assuming that the new variant is 40% more transmissible. And it's assuming that the amount of restrictions taken in Canada to prevent spread of the virus don't change. The vaccine is not going to kick in in Canada in enough time to prevent this. Now, <clears throat> what we have here, these are the existing, so these are the data points, and this is the best fit line for the existing cases. So they could well drift up. That's with the existing variant. With a 40% more transmissible variant, and with the same restrictions being taken, <clears throat> this is what could happen. That is uh, a pretty frightening line. Now, we're not saying this will happen. It's a modelling possible prediction, but it shows what can happen with a 40% more transmissible variant and no extra restrictions being taken. And I know this is a problem because it's, this is what's been the disaster in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, the, the terrible time we've had recently is, is due to this new variant. We would have been all right without this new variant. Please, if you're in the States and Canada, learn from, learn from us. L learn from the mistakes that have been... Well, we were probably first to discover it. I don't know if it was mistakes, but, but le learn from the trauma that the UK has been through with this new variant and is still in and, and prevented. And Europe, uh, this equally applies. Equally applies. Um... So this is from this uh, university group here. References there, of course, click on it. This is the trajectory we may see with a higher transmission variant. And they're looking at the B117. Now the Canada data is showing that the increase in transmission is 40 to 80%. Yesterday, uh, Chief Scientific Officer said 30 to 70%. Uh, the data I've looked at comes out at about 55%. But they modeled these predictions based on 40%. So the base, these models, that is based, this model, with that horrendous possible rise based on only 40% increased transmissibility. So variant with a 40% plus increase in transmission rate would likely not be contained with current measures. So the measures that are currently keeping that black line, um, reason well, still going up a bit, isn't it? But reasonably low would not be enough for the new red line with the new variant. So the Canadian authorities, as we'll see, are given some specific advice in a minute on this. So what does this mean? Uh, failure to prevent or contain this now spells disaster in March. Uh, now, this is a direct quote. I don't like the sound of this. Let's be quite clear. We're warning in Canada about a potential disaster in March with a new variant as we've gone through in the past month in the UK. And this also applies to the United States, a potential disaster at round about this same time scale. Now, you won't see much for six weeks, so the next month or so looks like it's going to be OK. But when it comes, when it comes, it comes in steeply. It comes in with a bit of a bang. Now, the doubling time with this new variant is going to be one to two weeks, seven to 14 days. Doubling time. Whereas the doubling time with the current variant is about 30 to 40 days. What a difference. That's data from Ontario recently picked up. So this is the idea of exponential growth. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I understand this bit. When you're halfway to the maximum capacity, so when your hospitals are going to be full or you run out of infrastructure, uh, when you're halfway to the maximum capacity you can tolerate, you only have one doubling time left before you're at what you can't tolerate. And the doubling time is 7 to 14 weeks. So if you are reactive to this problem, it's going to overwhelm you. You must be proactive and act ahead of time. Otherwise, you're going to be have one doubling time left when the hospitals can no longer cope, and that's only two weeks away if you don't take action at an earlier stage. But it might have taken uh, eight doublings to get to that halfway time. So it can take eight doublings where everything's looking rosy, everything's looking fine, well, relatively fine, 
but it's doubling, then it doubles one more time and you've got to half your capacity, doubles one more time and you're at your capacity, doubles another time, another two weeks, and you've got twice as many people trying to get into hospital as you have beds for. Potential disaster in March in Canada. And potentially in other places. This is why I'm, I'm stressing this so much at the moment. So what shall we do? Uh, now, a few detected B117 cases already in Canada. Hope, hope that community spread has not yet been established. So we're hoping for the best. That, that, let's make that clear. But we know it's in the United States already and there will be some in Canada. But we need to prevent, or the Canadian authorities need to prevent introduction of new variants into Canada, obviously. Does this work? Look at, South, look at West Australia. Yes, this works. No community transmission since about last March in Western Australia due to border restrictions. This works. Set up quarantine and isolation of travellers. Now, in the UK, we've just been switched on to this. So I'm not sure if the announcement's been made yet. I haven't checked in the last few hours, but um, the announcement will be getting made soon in the UK that anyone arriving into the UK, whether the UK citizen returning or anyone from overseas will have to quarantine in a hotel under supervision at their own expense, we think for 10 days at the moment. So this supervised uh, hotel-based uh, quarantine for returning travellers, that has been so effective in Australia. So that could need to be done in the United States and it could need to be done in um, in Canada. Now, this is not just for people coming from high-risk areas. That This is done in Australia. This is everyone. Everyone. And uh, there's a debate in the UK at the moment as to what form this will take. But um, we've already had, you see, in the UK, we've already had the B117, the UK Kent variant. We don't want the South African and we don't want the Brazilian one doing the same thing again. We really don't. And nowhere does. Improved detection of the virus is important. Now, this is going to be more genomic testing uh, for the whole thing more genomic testing and it's also possible to, to, to modify the PCR test to show up particular uh, show up particular variants as well. We were lucky in the UK that the, uh, the, the 501 mutation in the new mutation was picked up by the PCR test we were using. That was only pure good fortune but the, the test can be engineered to improve detection so we need to improve detection in Canada and the States. Be willing to act or curtail the spread of high transmission variants already in Canada. And of course, this applies to any country. And this could involve quite uh, draconian restrictions and lockdowns. But I tell you, if you avoid what we've been through uh, in the UK with the increasing cases and the lockdown we're in now, if you can avoid that, then please do so. Really, please do so. If and when we find out that the COVID-19 vaccines can impact transmission, and we think it's likely that they will, we could. Now, I'm going to tell you what they could do in a minute. Now, what, what, what this is saying, now, um, we don't want to cause confusion here. Now, we looked at Professor Van Tam yesterday saying, we have to assume that vaccination does not impede transmission. That's what we have to assume. We're waiting for the data. But these Canadian authors are saying, well, actually, we agree with that. I'm sure, I'm sure they'd say they agree with that. We have to behave the same. But actually, what we think is vaccination will reduce transmission. That's what we think. We'll know that soon. So this is the, uh, this is the approach that's been taken in um, is it Indonesia, I think. Where the, was it Indonesia, the Philippines? I'm, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, they were vaccinating people of younger ages who were more likely to, to spread the virus on. So this could be done in these countries to prevent spread of the new uh, new variants, that we could vaccinate people that are high risk for transmitting the virus, rather than vaccinating those most at risk of getting severe disease. Um, it's, it's a difficult question. I mean, I, I'm at moderate risk of getting severe disease and I haven't been vaccinated yet. And uh, if someone said I have to wait another month to be vaccinated because we're vaccinating some people that are at more risk of transmitting the disease, I would understand. But I can't say I'd be too happy about it. So um, it's, it really is a difficult one. It really is a difficult one. But that, that would be one possible way of curtailing the spread. We, we, we could 
target people who are at more risk of transmitting the virus. So the example they give is uh, vaccination as one tool in the transmission toolkit, breaking the transmission toolkit. And, and they specifically mention truckers going from Canada with relatively lower rates to the United States with much higher rates. So there's clearly a risk that truckers could pick up the, we call them lorry drivers in England, you could pick up the, the, the virus in the US, take it back to Canada. That's clearly possible. But if they were vaccinated, we would break that route of transmission. So um, do you want to vaccinate truck drivers and tell a particular group of uh, perhaps older people or people with comorbidities that they have to take risks with their lives for another week in this pandemic? Or do you want to uh, try and reduce the spread of new, more transmissible, more pathogenic variants by vaccinating your truck drivers in this case? It's a tricky one. Reduce travel within Canada, of course. Consider screening domestic travellers. So if the virus is in one part of Canada. So in the States, we saw that there's more of this virus in Florida and California. That would mean domestic travel needs to be needs to be curtailed. That, that's what that would mean. Uh, consider screening domestic travellers. Makes sense. Uh, vaccine is not going to impact transmission in the six to eight week time frame. So that is uh, just one fairly sophisticated modelling paper from Canada of a group who clearly see the risk uh, that is there. Now, I am going to, I don't normally talk about um, conspiracy theories and uh, um, anti-vaccination stuff, but I'm going to mention one in a minute, but the one I'm going to talk about is homeopathy. But anyway, a quick question here. Uh, Rob asks, what's going on? Apparently, the new strain is more lethal, but I was under the impression the virus evolves to be less deadly. That they can't be transmitted if the host dies. So, if anything, new viral strains should keep the host more alive. Please let me know if this assumption is wrong. No, the, the assumption is, is completely correct, Rob. So, what Rob is saying here is that over time, um, a virus will infect lots of people and it will kill some of them. And if, if a particular strain of the virus kills people then that vi because the person is dead, they will no longer transmit the virus. Usually, I mean, Ebola is a bit of an exception to that. But usually dead people don't transmit the virus, certainly not as effectively as living people. So that means that the person that was infected with a less virulent strain of the virus who didn't die, then the, that, that means that the less virulent strain of the virus will be selected for and that will go on. And this process will be repeated many times. So over time, a, a new virus becomes less virulent over time. That's the case with most viruses. But the SARS coronavirus 2 is different. And the reason it's different is that it spreads before people are sick. This, of course, is why we have a pandemic. So you could have a more virulent virus like we have now, a more transmissible virus that also we think causes more severe disease. So you can have that now. People get infected by it. Those people can go on and get s severely ill and some of them will go on and die. But they've already spread the virus. So this normal thing that Rob is talking about where viruses become less virulent, less transmissible over time is true. But unfortunately, this virus is an exception and it means that new, more transmissible, more deadly strains can propagate throughout the community because the virus has already spread by the time the selection pressure of host death has been removed. So I hope that answers that question, Rob. Very good question. I get asked that a lot. Now, don't normally talk about um, um, anti-vaccination things, but... There's, there's a lot of users following this page on, um, on Facebook called For Homeopathy that's recently been, reason, reason, recently been taken down. Now, the question is, someone's written this here. I'm not sure who wrote this. Does homeopathy have a role in preventing uh, and treating uh, COVID disease? Um, now, um, that's the question. Now, let me think about that. Right, I've thought about it. The answer is no. Um, no, absolutely not. Homeopathy is bunk. Now, I've just made a note here. Um, 
Let me tell you. So homeopathics, what they do is they, 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 make, they make up a solution. Now, what they say is like treats, like treats like. OK, so th what they would say is our current method of medicine is allegopathic. We, we are giving the opposite to what someone has. So if someone's got a bacterial infection, we give a, an antibiotic. Whereas in home homeopathy, you would give something that's the same. Now, that idea is strange, but not entirely ludicrous. We could investigate that. But the point is, to get rid of toxicity, what homeopaths do is they dilute it several times. So they'll, they'll take, I mean, what, what one form of dilution is called the C dilution. So they'll take a solution, they'll make up a homeopathic solution. Then they'll take, uh, say, say, they, say they make a litre of that. Then they'll take 10 mils of that and d dilute that into another litre of water. Then they'll mix that up and they'll take 10 mils of that. So you get serial dilutions dividing by 100 every time. And this is called their C dilution series. Now, by the time you get to 12C, which is, is not uncommon for homeopathic dilution, they often go up to more than that, 20 or 30C. By the time you get to 12C, there's a 60% chance you've got one molecule of the original substance left in your preparation. One molecule left. And of course, if it's a 13, 14, 15, 16, 20, 30C, the, the overwhelming probability, overwhelming massive probability is if you have zero molecules in the entire preparation of the original substance. So the contention in homeopathy is that you give zero molecules and that has some sort of pharmacodynamic effect. It, this is just, this is just uh, scientific nonsense. Now, some people have accused me of being um, very hard and over dismissive of homeopathy. And I want to make it clear that is exactly what I am doing. I am dismissing it. It's unscientific nonsense. Now, having said that, uh, patients often come to me and say, I'm taking this homeopathic uh, preparation. Uh, is it OK? And I, I've always said, yeah, it's fine as long as you take your normal medicines as well, because it won't do any harm. Because giving nothing doesn't do any harm, nor does it do any good. So... Um, Absolute nonsense. And homeopaths say that um, the more you dilute it, <coughs> the more you dilute it, the more potent it becomes. I mean, this is just it's, this is just scientific nonsense. You know, we're either evidence based or we're not, and this is not evident. This is not evidence based. Anyway, let's look at this. So, this for homeopathy group has been taken down by Facebook as as a disinformation site. Now. As I said, homeopathy is, is, is a harmless eccentricity unless people are replacing normal therapy with it. And this is what has been adjudged to be the case here, that they were making claims that these homeopathic preparations could prevent COVID-19 infection. In other words, essentially, work as a vaccine, which they can't. Now, as I say, I don't like drawing attention to this, but the only reason I'm doing it is a lot of people still believe in homeopathy. Um, and uh, it, it has no scientific basis whatsoever, as I've just explained. No active molecules can have no effect in anything that we understand. Um, so for homeopathy group. Now, apparently this represents 11 leading homeopathic organisations and charities. Uh, Facebook post dated the 5th of January. Diluted duck heart and liver extract. Now, I mean... Duck heart and liver extract. So presumably what happens, they take uh, ducks that have been killed for duck meat, presumably. They take out the hearts and the liver. They make a homeopathic dilution, uh, solution of this. Then they do these serial dilutions until there's no molecules of duck heart and liver extract left. And then they say that that has some therapeutic effect. Um, I mean, duck... Duck heart and liver extract. I mean, it sounds like toad of frog and wing of bat. I mean, this is just nonsense. Um, the COVID-19 um, prevention study received spectacular results in one million people. So this is what's being claimed. that This has spectacular results. I don't think so. Um, they say it's a viable uh, modality in the treatment of COVID-19. No, it's not. Go to your doctor. If you are ill, coronavirus uh, as a as a unique opportunity to use the current crisis for strengthening the foundations of homeopathy, presumably as they demonstrate that it's effective. I don't think so. So this is rubbish. I'm going to cross it all out in anger. Um, you know, the idea that, th that this could prevent people seeking proper medical care 
is, is a risk um, that we shouldn't be taking. Professor Stephen Powers, NHS Medical Director. Um, it's one thing for homeopaths to peddle useless and harmless potions, I agree. But they cross a dangerous line when making ridiculous assertions about people, about protecting people from COVID-19 uh, infection. So they've crossed the line when they make these ridiculous assertions. I'm just going to read that again because I, I kind of like that, that choice of words. Um, it's one thing for homeopaths to peddle useless but harmless potions. Who cares? But they cross a dangerous line when making ridiculous assertions about protecting people from COVID-19 uh, infections. Um, we urge everyone, this again, direct quote from the Professor Powers. Uh, we, we urge everyone to ignore misleading claims that get uh, vital uh, and get and get vital protection against COVID-19 when they are invited for their vaccine, which we completely agree with, Professor. Thank you for making that clear. Duck extract products selling on eBay, apparently. Let's hope they're taken down. We don't approve. Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority in the UK says these cannot be legally sold or supplied within the United Kingdom. Quite rightly so. Right. Sorry if that was over-emotional. <laughs> uh, um, sometimes you forget you're being filmed and it just, um, just comes out. There you go. We all have our little weaknesses. Yeah, let's hope that doesn't happen. Okay, last thing I want to mention today, uh, J Japanese Olympics aren't going to happen anyway, I can see. Scheduled for the 23rd to the 28th, t t t 23rd of July to the 8th of August. Can't, can't see it, can you? Really can't see it. Right, let's close with a few pictures from Judith today. Judith is in Toronto. So um, there's a series of like public health posters <clears throat> up around Toronto that are quite interesting. Um, <coughs> running stalling 2020, it's got a virus. Until then, please follow pandemic protocols. Wear a mask, watch your distance, wash your hands, isolate if you get symptoms and do ventilate shared areas. Avoid COVID like the plague. Well, Toronto authorities, I think I agree with that. Avoid COVID like the plague. Stay home as much as possible. Yep, good. So I think I think these are very personalised um, uh, information from the Toronto authorities that are uh, getting the message across. Uh, the new normal is uh, suboptimal and less ple pleasant than we would like. Let's get back to the old normal. Let's hope so. So that's from the Toronto. These are publicly posted uh, uh, and pavements and things around about Toronto. <laughs> uh, what's this one? Okay, it's a serious look. I tested positive for COVID fatigue. Oh, yes. Keep up the fight. We'll get through this. And indeed, we will get through this. So again, I think these are quite clever. I think people can relate to these. Thanks for sending these in, Judith. These are, these are good. Is that the last one? I think there was a few more, but that's all I've managed to copy. So there we go. Um, a window of opportunity um, um, for many countries. Do, do 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 take it if you have any influence, and of course we all have influence over ourselves and our behaviour, which we have to get in order first. So um, thank you for watching this video, of course.